Hi, I'm Jim and I'm a gamer. We don't always like gamers a whole lot in our society. Um, generally speaking, we uh, think they're kind of strange. Uh, gamers have just now been starting to get featured in media for the first time in a long time. And uh, when we do, it kind of feels less like we're characters in a regular show and more like the subject of a National Geographic special. Um, I'm waiting for the day when we just hear an announcer come over there. You know, um, we're in the basement looking at the gamer. Um, see how he's built a nest in his subterranean lair out of empty Hot Pocket wrappers and Mountain Dew cans. <laughs> By not showering, the gamer has built an insulating layer of grease that protects him from the rare occasions he walks out into the sun. You know, then you just hear, um, suck it, noob. Oh, wow, by shouting suck it, noob, or newbie, the gamer is attempting to assert social dominance over the other gamers, thus assuring his place in the hierarchy. Um, so what we've learned is that gamers are pretty weird. And um, so I want to I wanna start off with um, looking at gamers. So we're going to do a quick game here. And that is, I want you to try to spot the gamer in this picture. So I want everybody to try to take a second here and um, make your guesses. And hopefully a few of you have figured out the game. Um, and that is that every single one of those people is actually a gamer. Um, most of them, actually about half of them are my students who volunteered for this. But um, anyways, um, the thing that I wanted to bring forward is that gamers actually, despite popular opinion or popular rumor, um, come from every single walk of life. They come from every socioeconomic background. They come from all kinds of ethnic diversities. Um, recent su studies suggest that 97% of your high school students are actually gamers, which means that if we're not engaging gamers on their level, we're missing some huge opportunities for engagement. Um, so when I was thinking about my own program, um, I wanted to start thinking about how could we make this a game, and I've been a game designer for a long time, so I was thinking how could we make school into a game? And in order to accomplish this mission, I had to look at games that we're playing. And so one of my favorite types of games, and I thought this was a good model for education, is the uh, RTS. So how many of you guys here play RTS games? And we got a couple, not too many. Um, so how many people in the room actually know what an RTS game is? Okay, only a few more. <laughs> All right, so, <laughs> um, so an RTS game is a real-time strategy game. And a real-time strategy game is a game where we have um, a collection of resources, such as in StarCraft II, you've got a collection of resources. And the core feature of the gameplay is that we have to manage those resources and use those to create units and buildings and use those units and buildings and other tools to accomplish objectives. So now I want to ask, um, especially the teachers in the room, but I'm curious with everybody else, for how many of you guys does that sound like a familiar experience? Okay, so I was looking at breaking things down. So if you're an English teacher, for example, you, we start looking at our resources when we're trying to create our game. And um, you've got some of the obvious ones. You've got textbooks and the class novels. Um, you've got pens and paper and whiteboard markers and all those cool things. But we've also got some indirects. We've got money, um, which I know we're all aware of, but we don't usually like work with it directly. Um, my bookkeeper at our, my school insists that teachers are like supposed to be allergic to money. We're not even allowed to touch it. Um, so. Uh, We've got money and we've got things like guest speakers that aren't really ours, but we borrow them from time to time. And then we've also got um, time. And I think time is a resource that teachers are aware of, um, but one of the things I don't think we realize about time is that we can actually get time back. Um, it's less linear than we think. And so, again, using StarCraft as my example, um, I wanted to look at minerals. So in StarCraft, Minerals is the main resource we work with. And you use those minerals to generate other things, um, buildings and combat units and things like that. And, um, the th and you have these little things called probes. 
And probes, if you're playing Protoss, um, probes are one of the things that you can use and you can collect more minerals. The, the thing is, is that in order to do that, you have to build them and they actually cost minerals. So the incentive here is to go, hmm, well, I don't think I need so many of those because that's going to cost me a bunch of minerals. But what the savvy players figure out pretty early on, and the rest of us figure out later the hard way, is that we can take our minerals and our probes and invest them and basically get more minerals by investing a little bit than what we spent. So I want to share two of my time investors. Um, and in my way, they're ways of getting more minerals out of my minerals. And the first one is students. So a lot of us think of students as an objective um, and their performance as an objective. And what I like to do is I like to think of students as one of the resources, which is a little bit different way of thinking about it. So one of the first things that I do in my classes is I group my students together and we start assigning challenges and they compete for Jim Bucks, which is a fantastically creative name. Um, I've got a copyright pending on that. Um, and uh, they compete for challenges, but the challenges, instead of having winners and losers and things like that, the challenges are structured so that any student could possibly trigger a win condition. So potentially, all 25 of my kids could win the challenge. Now, they don't all, all do it, but they could. And what this does is by changing that dynamic, the stronger students have an incentive to help the weaker ones. Because if I'm on a team with a weaker student, if they're not getting, winning a challenge, there's less gym bucks flowing into my, into my group. So I'm going to help them get through their challenge so that way they can, um, they can be more successful and I score more points. Um, and so this gets used in a lot of positive ways. First off, it increases peer pressure. The teams start telling kids, no, you need to show up, you need to be here, you need to be doing things, because anytime you're not here and not winning gym bucks, my team is losing points. Um, so we start using peer pressure in a positive way. The other thing that this does is it creates a several different remediation points around my classroom. I'm not the only remediator if there's a slow student. Um, and then the third thing that I love about it is that when we help other people learn, we actually retain it better ourselves, which I'm sure almost everybody in this room, if not everybody, has experienced before. Um, as a programming teacher, I know that I am a better programmer because I've had to make some thoughtful, deliberate choices when I'm teaching it on why do I do the things that I do. So um, using students as a resource is really helpful. The other resource that I like to use is online learning management systems, or LMSs. And I use Moodle. Um, I know Eastside Prep uses one called Canvas. Um, there's a bunch of them out there. They're all awesome. Um, but the, you can do two basic things with it. Like any other website, you can use Moodle to um, spew out content, and they can read it, and they can regurgitate it, and all those kinds of things like we usually do. Um, but you can also create assignments on there. And the real power with assignments in an online curriculum system is that as the students answer questions, it immediately gives them feedback on whether they're right or wrong. And there's some real power to this. As, instead of having a situation where um, you're doing 1 through 50 even, and you do 25 problems, and then you get, you get back to school, and you find out you got them all wrong, um, you find out as you go. Which means instead of learning something wrong 25 times and getting 25 times practice wrong, you get it fixed immediately. You already know whether you're right or wrong. Um, the other advantage to this is it also gives you a sense of a progress bar. And we love progress bars. Gamers love progress bars because it tells us how far we got to go to finish the quest. Um, so it serves as a little bit of an incentive. Now, from a teacher's standpoint, I love this because it also gives me some awesome demographics. My favorite is item analysis. So in the previous example, 1 through 50 even, let's say all my kids had problems with number 4 and then some problems with some of the other problems. Now, normally as a math teacher, you can't go in and say, OK, let's see how well the kids did without extensive work. We can't go, how well did the students do on each individual problem? But Moodle will actually tell you, OK, I did really, the kid, they did really well on this, not so good on this. And so you can target your remediation. The other thing is, is it's adding all these items to your grade book, scoring them, doing all of that normal logistical boring paperwork that none of us like to do, but we have to do it because we're responsible. And it does all that for you, which gives you more time to do what's really important, 
working with kids and developing curriculum and learning other stuff. Um, so when we're designing a game and we're thinking of students as resources, we also have to think about how we're going to play the game. And teaching is a multiplayer kind of an experience. And anytime you have a multiplayer game, there's two basic ways we can go about playing a multiplayer game. We've got PvE and PvP. And um, PvP is player versus player. It's games like Mortal Kombat. Um, and it's basically where two or more individuals or groups of individuals are competing against each other for some kind of an objective. Um, the other option is PvE, which is player versus environment. These are games like Guild Wars 2, where different types of players work together to try to solve some kind of a problem. Um, and so I decided I wanted a PvE model for my classroom, and I think most of us want that PvE model. Um, the problem in my mind is that um, not all students feel like they're playing a PvE game, even when we're really trying to. And I used to work in an alternative school, and during intake, we used to ask students, why are you here? Because generally speaking, an alternative school student doesn't come to an alternative school unless they've been un unsuccessful wherever they previously were. So um, most of their feedback actually surprised me because it had a lot to do with staff and um, the way that they perceived their experiences in school. And I'm Facebook friends through my gaming community. I'm Facebook friends with a number of high school students. And I see posts that kind of bother me, and so I'm going to share a few of those. Um, the first one is, I hate it when teachers deliberately embarrass you. I hate it when teachers make you feel stupid even when you're trying. I hate it when teachers group kids together that we know won't be successful. Now, in my mind, these three things are kind of sad, and I also feel like they're a little untrue. Um, and there, it's a perception, it's a truthful perception, but I don't know any teachers that would actually do any of those things deliberately or intentionally, but regardless of our intention, that's the perception. So what we need to be doing is we need to be working on that perception. So we need to be working on making our games feel more like a PvE kind of a game. Um, when we're working on our curriculum planning and our teaching and things like that, we're hoping for a class that looks a little something like this. Um, this is completely staged. Uh, <laughs> we're looking for students who are active and eager and engaged. Um, it took quite a bit of effort to get them to pose for that long. The easier photo was to get this one, which is what I think a lot of our classes start to feel like. Um, and a lot of teachers talk about the cell phone as one of the major culprits in this, and I made sure I got a few of them to do cell phones in their pictures. And there's been a lot of solutions to the cell phone problem. Um, here's one that I also saw on Facebook. I spend a lot of time on Facebook. We may want to do an intervention during the break. But um, anyways, um, so here's one of them. This is the cell phone caddy. Um, but in my mind, I think that this is kind of a wrong approach. Um, because what we're doing is we're trying to take away the distraction, but the distraction isn't the problem. The problem is, is that for a lot of these kids, they'd rather be in this world. Um, gamers would rather be out slaying a dragon than learning about the Gettysburg Address. And in my mind, I'm wondering why we need to know things like, what's the date of the Gettysburg Address? when um, I can whip out my cell phone, ask Google, when was the Gettysburg Address happen, and it'll tell me, and why do I need to know that now? Um, and I think it's important still that we know things like the whys behind things, but sometimes specific facts I don't feel like we necessarily need to know. And I think that cell phones, instead of trying to take them away, I feel like we should be using them as one of the tools. It's one of our resources. Okay, why would we throw out a tool, especially to these students who are technology natives? Okay, they grew up with these technologies. My nine-year-old niece has a cell phone. Okay, it's pervasive, it's all over, and why don't we take advantage of it? So instead of taking away their cell phones, how about we start making them part of the game? Instead of having them be taken away, why don't we make quests where you have to look up and complete pieces of data where the students have to actually use their devices, use their DS, use their cell phone, use their laptop, use their tablets, all these things, and try to recover more information. They like texting. Why don't we create an adventure where they have to text with other people, other students, maybe even other schools, um, adults, people in the, our respective industries, things like that, to actually solve problems or complete challenges or complete tasks. 
Um, so if we can leverage the cell phones and the technology to make it more effective for our kids, maybe we don't need to take it away after all. And on the subject of those other people, um, I don't feel like my game has enough players because as a game designer, one of our main goals, because that's how we make money, is getting more people to play our game. Now, I'm lucky, I teach at a school where I only teach two classes, we're on a long block kind of a format, so I only have 60 students. And for me, designing a game for 60 players is a little bit small. Um, but fortunately, I'm also career in tech ed. And for those of you who are career in tech ed, you already know about advisory committees. Those of you who aren't, advisory committees are basically a group of people, usually adults, who have some kind of an experience in your subject area. And you use them as a resource to help you develop new curriculum, make sure you're staying on current technology, all those kind of groovy kinds of things. But what I do is I use my advisory committee also as players in my game. So students interact with my advisory committees on a pretty regular basis. In fact, actually literally right now while I'm talking to you, uh, my advisory committee is sitting through pitch panels with my students um, because I'm not there today, and so they were like, hey, we'll step in, we'll take over your class for you for the day. So I have a substitute who's sitting in the corner taking attendance, and then my advisory committee is um, actually working with my kids for the day. So what we've done is we've taken the game and we've added players to it. So um, in closing, what I want to say is that instead of taking away devices, instead of trying to limit students, I think what we need to be doing is changing it into a game where everybody can play, we need to get more players, we need to get more resources, we need to get more types of resources. Let's use the technology, let's use the students, let's use the other people, and let's make better use of our time, and we can make a better game. The top game companies in the world use this along with feedback mechanisms, um, which is also provided by our advisory committees, to, gen generate, their, um, to generate their games and that's what helps make them successful. I think that we can take some of those methods and use them to make us more successful too. Thank you.